Yeah, you should be. I'm going to be watching you close. Good. Well, that is one thing. Um, it's, we're, we're at time, and I'm going to start in here pretty quick. But I want to tell you all, I want this to be a group discussion. Okay, I do have some material prepared because it's not my first rodeo at check. Okay, um, I know you're going to want to see some stage show, but I really do want this to be a conversation. I'm also going to encourage folks if you've if you've got the bandwidth and it's not a problem to enable your video. Um, the rules of the road here for me are um, interrupt, get my attention in chat. I've I've asked Susie if there's something in chat that she sees and I don't to interrupt me because. I'd like to cover things as they happen. If I say something that resonates with you, I have some bold statements today and, and I want to talk about them. And we've got plenty of time. I'm not going to I'm not going to run out with content. So for those that may not know me, I'm Court Buffington. I'm the executive director of the Kansas Research and Education Network, also called CANREN. CANREN has been around since 1992. We are a public charity that operates a statewide data network serving public, uh, public service institutions, primarily higher ed. Higher ed is the bulk of our membership and utilization of our network. Um, above all, we're problem solvers. I don't want, uh, the one thing I don't want anyone to walk away from here with today is that we're an ISP. If you think that now, I'm gonna try to change your mind. What CANREN is, is one of the best examples of public institution collaboration in the state. We've been here for 29 years. We were started by public higher ed in Kansas and we remain um, majority governed by higher education in Kansas. I think we're one of the best success stories. Every time you hear folks at the state talk about how higher ed doesn't work together, we would not be here and successful if higher education was not capable of working together. We promote operational and fiscal efficiency above all else. That's the target. All right, I'm going to jump right in. No, no one wanted to call me out on that yet, right? Okay, good. I'm gonna to talk today about the transformative effects of broadband infrastructure on higher education. What that really means is why we need dark fiber. The vast majority of states in the United States have had dark fiber backbones for over a decade. The orange states are the ones who don't. Now, there are a few states out there that don't have enough higher education dispersed around the state adequately to have a backbone network. So those, um, are, those states are green if the universities they do have are interconnected to a gigapop or a regional, much like the Great Plains network with dark fiber. Note, Kansas is one of four. Canren is not an anomaly. We are not just some one-off thing that happens here, uh, hopefully. As several of you I know were in James's presentation earlier. This is the second time today you've seen this slide. These are the other r and &E networks in the United States and all of their, the, depicting their networks and all of the interconnectivity in between us. This is a big machine in our nation. But back to the fiber thing, so why not Kansas? Why don't we have this? There's a lot of reasons. I think we all know what they are. They go back to the same reasons why we all have funding challenges. Um, we are funded by all of you. So we're, uh, CanREN is really a reflection of the fiscal situation you find yourselves in. And believe me, I very much appreciate that. But we do have some things, uh, some other issues at hand. We have siloed state agencies that don't work together. Um, while decentralized higher ed may not necessarily be a problem, it is difficult to pass up that states that have been highly successful deploying this have more centralized higher education systems. We have definitely had a lack of broadband vision in our state that's largely been brought about by the influence of the, tele, of the commercial telecommunications industry and indifference from our legislature. So this whole thing about dark fiber, spoiler alert, this is not about more bits per second. When, when planning to come talk to you today, 
I reached out to my colleagues uh, across the nation. James is one of them. He saw the communication go out. And I asked him, I said, what are the reasons that you have dark fiber? Why does it work for you? What, what is, what's the big deal about it? And I got so many answers back. And by the way, those colleagues are the executive directors or CEOs of the other r &E networks in the nation. And the information that came back from them, uh, it just started pouring in so rapidly, I was honestly at a loss for how to present it. And then I remembered there's this cool thing called a word cloud, so I made one. And this is a word, I, I normalized some of their responses and tried to categorize them, you know, so I didn't have 75 words in here. Uh, but this is the word, word cloud formed. Note what the big things are here. Cost avoidance, flexibility, agility, provision, as in provisioning service, opportunity, stability. Security and privacy didn't reach very high on the word cloud, but those are terms I hear come up a lot in our discussions, that, that the dark fiber infrastructure enables a level of privacy and security. Most importantly, and what I believe a lot of my colleagues have forgotten about over the years that they've had this, is it also decouples cost from capacity. Uh, that means how much you need today or tomorrow doesn't have a whole lot to do with what it costs to deploy or maintain the infrastructure. That frees us up from constantly changing markets and creates a greater financial stability. It also changes our planning horizon from three to five years to 10 to 20 years. And I'm gonna to touch on that again. That's very important. Infrastructure versus service, new opportunities for collaboration. When we build an infrastructure, instead of just trying to provide service, we have a much larger asset at our disposal. And that's an asset that we can use for collaboration beyond just with each other. That gives us more opportunities to work throughout the state at greater levels. And I'm talking about even working with the private sector. It's a foundation to build on. It promotes innovation. But above all else, it's an enabler. I'm gonna go back to James's presentation an hour ago. I couldn't have asked him to set me up better if I if I tried and, and I didn't ask him to do this. One of the thing, one of the reasons why Canren hasn't been able to engage as much in cyber infrastructure, high performance computing, and, and these efforts that you hear about GPN doing such a great job with, and they do a great job by the way. Uh, and other things that you don't hear about so much. Why don't we have ubiquitous edgeroam statewide? Why hasn't Canran been out helping people understand the value of edgeroam? How come we're not helping deploy uh, federated identity management? Why aren't we pushing in common from Internet 2 to all of you more? Why aren't we doing all of these things? r &E networks are about a lot more than connectivity in bits per second. But I'll be honest, Canran doesn't do a lot of them. One of the reasons we don't is we spend about three years out of every five just planning for our next five-year backbone cycle because we're stuck with lit service from telcos largely. I'm going to hammer on this just a little bit more, and here's where we have to get interactive. I'm going to equate what we're trying to do statewide to what you all have on your campuses. What if the connectivity between your buildings was with lit service? What would it be like every time a new need was identified? And, and you don't get to say, well, we ran out of fiber between a couple of buildings last year. That, that's not fair game. What would that be like? Interactive, guys, you tell me. Do you, I mean, how much lit service do you buy? I know what it would be like, I will, but I want to know. Uh, how much you've all had to interact with the industry on this kind of service for this kind of service for transport? Be a lot of phone calls and a lot of sitting around and waiting. So the first thing is, it would take you at least thirty days just to get meetings on the calendar with the telecommunications carriers that could work in your area. You'd have to have two to three meetings before you started a sixty to ninety day process of actually being able to get all of the quotes and all of the details ironed out and an award made. 
at the end of that time, you'd be told it's somewhere between 60 and 180 days before the service is deployed. The opportunity you had was gone before you even met with those folks. Moreover, living with that lit service, plan on about five nights a week for six hours. That service could just go down and you probably won't be notified. This is what I mean when I say Canrenan has to put a lot of resources into operating this, the, our, our backbone network primarily built on lit services. It's not just the money we pay, even though dark fiber over time comes out to not be that much difference in cost as long as we, as long as we predict well how much lit service we need but it's also where the effort goes of our organization and how much time we spend chasing outages, unannounced maintenance windows, problems with other customers of that carrier that affected us, and how much of that time we do not spend on innovation and how much of that time we can't spend doing things like promoting identity management, promoting high performance computing and cyber infrastructure. I think we all know our institutions are absolutely critical in realizing the dream of Kansas's economic future. Which of us ha at this point in time has not heard the dream now? Uh, I'm going to say it again. One of my mentors once told me, you've not told people something enough times until they tell you to stop. So maybe with the exception of Mark, he doesn't get to tell me to stop. He knows this too well, but the rest of you can. What we hear about from the state these days is all about fixing the broadband problem in the state and the focus is always on rural broadband. And the image that is always invariably painted is a young couple who have great jobs in the city, high tech, whatever, they're gonna move to rural Kansas because you know, maybe they, you know, starting a family, maybe mom or dad grew up there and they like the small town life, they like the pace, they like the values, they wanna live here. And in the state's broadband planning, what we hear is what we need is good residential broadband for that to work. I don't sell that young couple looking to move back to Kansas that short. I don't believe they're going to simply say, I've got great broadband at home. I can do my job for my big high tech company in the city and live here. I think they're going to look at the municipal services offered. I think they're going to look at the K-12 capabilities. I think they're going to look at the public library and they are also going to look at that community college that's one county away. They're going to look at the private college. They're going to look at the university that's 50, 75 miles away. If all of those organizations do not have the resources that they need to create the, the vision of the future, then I don't think we're ever going to realize that economic dream. And the broadband, that is the broadband that is promoted and where we focus all of our effort and money in this state is rural residential. And those services do not help our institutions. I mean, come on. Someone tell me, how much can you do with 100 down and 50 up off of a cable modem to serve your institution? but that is what our state promotes. Improved broadband infrastructure is vital to the future of Kansas higher education. We are seeing a national progression towards incorporating artificial intelligence, machine learning, quantum computing. Every research and scientific discipline relies on cyber infrastructure. We need to lower the barrier to entry and commit to sustaining that cyber infrastructure. It has to be available everywhere. Now, I can't see everybody because I don't have enough real estate to get all of the video tiles on, but does anyone here, and please do not be bashful. Do you know what cyber infrastructure is? If, if you do not, speak up, please. All right, great. I'll be honest. 
we were building cyber infrastructure for years before I actually knew what the word meant. So I wanted to make sure that no one else was in that situation. Canron has a vision for a connected Kansas. And um, I saw Gary was on here earlier, but he leaked off my screen. I hope he's still here. Oh, okay, now I can see everyone, good. Okay, so several of the architects of this vision are here or at least the people who have been promoting me to continue to architect it. This is what our fiber footprint in Kansas looks like today. In fact, that line from Kansas City down to Wichita uh, has just come online in the last week. Be moving traffic to it over the next two weeks. We'll be running on it through June before uh, an official go live of July 1. But this is it. And by the way, it took us years, like a decade, to get to the point of that one piece. The first step is we need all of the public universities. By the way, Washburn is a public university. That's why you hear me use the word public, not state. We need all of the public universities on that dark fiber network. And we need another exit point from the state that's not just Kansas City. Far too much of the state of Kansas is dependent upon downtown Kansas City. In reality, there will be just a little bit more than the dark red lines. There will be some lighter ones in here. I wouldn't expect that we would have all of these, but the reality is a fully built network to serve as many as possible is going to have a little bit more connectivity. And of course, now you see a bunch of community colleges show up on here, and you're probably wondering, what about the other anchor institutions? Well, if I tried to put them all on this diagram, you wouldn't even be able to see the outline of the state underneath it. So I had to cap it somewhere, and I went with public higher ed. And yes, there are several not directly on the fiber map, but some could be spurs. Yes. I just want to say that uh, this current diagram that you're showing right here is more like majority of the state networks in your quilt. I just wanted to stress that to other people on the call that, that that picture right there is what we typically see in most state networks. Thank you. And by the way, James, the part I wanted to ask you to call me out about earlier is I really do believe that we have not had the level of uptake on advanced, uh, advanced services, things like um, collaboration with high performance computing, taking advantage of cyber infrastructure. You don't see Canren out being able to put on our own, um, our own carpentry workshops. You don't see us out at Pitt State or Washburn or Hayes um, or even community colleges. I mean, you don't see us out there trying to help people learn how to prep a job to run on a high performance computer. The jobs are there. There are people out there who could use it. I think one of the big reasons why you don't see us doing it is because we have spent so much time just trying to keep up with the base level of connectivity that I will be honest and go on record with all of you today. Canren is not, not meeting the level it should for providing the full breadth of what RNE networks are here to do. It's not just about connectivity. But when we don't have the base level we need, it's very hard to focus on the other stuff. This is the last of my prepared presentation, which is great because I wanted to have a conversation and I'm going to continue to try to drag you guys into it. So video on, let's talk. What would you do with limit? Notice I didn't say bandwidth. I said limitless connectivity. How would it, ch how could it change what you do? because I don't want to just talk about how it would change what we do. This is going to be a very mm -hmm. short presentation. My, I was going to say mine's not very good, but um, you know, when this pandemic started, I grew up on a farm outside of a small town called Powhatan, Kansas. It's outside of a smaller town, Hiawatha, Kansas. And there was a moment where I thought like, 
maybe I could move back home for a while and hang out. I mean, I don't know. The pandemic was kind of weird, but you know, it, it's expensive to live where I live. And I thought, well, if my institution, if the state of Kansas had better connectivity overall, maybe it would give me more options on where I could, I could live. So I'm gonna draw a line between a, a couple of things. Thank you, Susie, that was a great comment. So I went back and looked and when we talk about broadband development, we talk about it even outside of the institutional aid. I'm going to tell you, CANREN is focused mostly on what you need at your campuses. But I looked back over the years, CANREN has been a key stakeholder that capitalized several fiber builds across this state already. Since about, uh, let's see, yep, about 15 years ago, when we go back to the telecommunications industry and we've asked for services on that, you know, five year backbone cycle of lit service, I went back through and looked through a bunch of the proposals. It's surprising how many of them included exorbitantly high fees we were charged because the carrier that we were working with needed to build fiber to make it work. CANREN has capitalized, and if CANREN did, that means all of you did. We have been capitalizing middle mile fiber builds to Cox Communications and Kansas Fiber Network for 15 years in the state. So did we solve the broadband problem? No, but the investments that we've made already have made a difference. We have moved the needle and the kind of infrastructure we're talking about building here will move it even farther. One of my visions with this is if we have that um, and let's say you're from a smaller area and one of the concerns that exists in that area is that residential users don't have the connectivity they need. If that is important to make it, and I'm gonna spread it beyond higher education now and say if that is important to make education work in the state of Kansas, then why can't CANREN provide trans transport service to that commercial carrier, that startup, that mom and pop that's trying to do a local fiber deployment? People talk about last mile all the time, but what you don't hear mentioned very often is middle mile. And without middle mile fiber to get out of those landlocked areas in the state, we greatly cripple the ability of small carriers, startups, and mom and pops from being able to do, uh, from being able to bring competition in, in the broadband space. Yeah, I think we've made a difference. And I think that even when we do this, we continue to make a difference for residential users, even if we're not out there burying fiber to the home ourselves. I got a lot of CANREN board members on here. So Court, this is Mary. This is really a follow-up to what Susie said. You know, what we encountered during the pandemic, we had students who were learning remotely, but they didn't have access to internet. Um, what their experience was to come to campus if they had to, or if they were living on campus residentially, that solved the problem. But when they moved back home, especially to rural Kansas, but you know, there's, there's plenty of suburban and urban areas that have some challenges. Um, we live in one. <laughs> uh, that caused a lot of challenges and we didn't have, you know, the best we could come up with was hotspots but there was a, a really high probability they didn't have cell coverage either. So this, this will continue to be a challenge as we expand into more online programming. Yep, it's not overnight. So what, uh, with, what I am hoping is I am hoping that with all of the federal money coming out for infrastructure and broadband that we solve this institutional brick and mortar campus problem with the backbone we have first. And, and why I'm taking a long-term approach here. I, I know that was a big deal, but there, I do not, I don't know about the rest of you, I don't believe this is the last pandemic. I don't think it's gonna be another 100 years before this happens again. And I certainly don't, I just certainly don't wanna bank on that. Other states in the nation that have already built what we're trying to build, uh, what we're trying to build now, do you know what they're looking to do? This is our, this is our big thing right now. Do you know what theirs is? And I'm so glad, James, I'm so glad you're here because this probably sounds fantastic. They are building 5G LTE networks statewide to solve the very problem, Mary, that you talked about. 
That's happening in several states and it is ramping up and more. Those that have already built their backbones, they've already built the spurs off to the smaller institutions, they're leveraging that investment they already have and they're putting up their own networks. And, and I think that if a gap continues long enough, that is exactly where it will be. We're just a little behind right now. I guess I'd, I'd like to point out, I mean, I don't know how many people realize on the call, you know, there's, um, I guess, uh, uh, about $150 billion um, that look like they're gonna be funded or federal, uh, funding opportunities for broadband, uh, especially if the LIFT Act moves forward. There, there's like 94 billion just in that, just for broadband. I mean, a lot, obviously a lot of that is focused on specific targeted areas like 10 billion of it's associated with tribal and HBCUs, you know, 10 billion associated with very targeted processes that the treasury is still yet to define. But at least 20 billion, which would mean a baseline of 100 million per state that, that, that they get to decide what to do with will be out of the LIFT Act. And so I know there's several folks in our community have talked about what, what would be the best way to use that because we see failure after failure of funding going into you know the 25 and three and uh, the idea of the lift act is to solve it for once and for all and so um the states that have that middle mile it enables a, an ongoing perpetual um path for additional funding because uh, for instance usda has these uh rest grants that allow or anyway, that allow targeted um funding for building up wisp you know wireless internet providers so in those very very last resort areas you still um, have opportunities for targeted funding of these other grants but they still have to connect somewhere and the problem is without that middle mile they're bogged down trying to negotiate with the one choice and all their funding goes towards buying transit from the person that they can backhaul to without the middle mile you're not be able to make it easier for those other grants to actually for other companies to stand up and solve the problems in the communities that they're passionate about and so that's the one thing i've seen i, I was very fortunate before my per current role to be part of a, of a 74 million dollar um, stimulus project just to build a middle mile network and that middle mile network now connects 20 different providers that are targeted you know they have their own met they have their own areas that they serve and they get backhaul across this this level setting middle mile that's coordinated by multiple state partnerships and in that way they can get reasonable costs of internet to these very rural parts of the state and so i've seen firsthand the, the value of that kind of framework that uh that court showed you know where you're not you know you're only being that level setter for the parts of the country that nobody is wanting to invest in from an infrastructure perspective and not I mean, in are beautiful parts of the country but you know if the you know the all right <laughs> return on the investment is not going to ever meet you know um the goals of some of these companies and so um i i, I would just encourage you to do whatever you can to get the uh, straight broadband coordinators all on the same page so that when that hundred million dollars and then there's going to be formulaic amounts that are added to that based on all sorts of crazy math that I don't even want to think about. But 100 million of these should be in the hands of the state to decide what's best. And if you all have a game plan that says, hey, let's drop this middle mile in because we have a track record of failure of solving the broadband in rural Kansas, then you have a model that you know uses the public higher ed system as that community anchor to make this function long term. And the partnerships work because you're partnering with industry. I mean, it just, it's a beautiful model. And I just hope that the game plan is on that trajectory. I'm sorry to interject there, all that. No, but, no, oh. that's good. There, there are, there are startups out there, small businesses that want to work in the area, in the areas that the traditional carriers don't want to. The problem is they can't get out of that service area without going back to one of those carriers and guess what those carriers do to them to get transport out of there. I think James, the uh, and both James and Court know, and my Ritzy colleagues know that I'm passionate about this specific issue. So um, my brothers, I apologize for you hearing my uh, my diatribe again. But uh, your key, you have a couple points on what you just said, James. That I think are key for us, and one is it needs to be a partnership, and number two is it's going to the states um, and. 
those two don't necessarily align. And so I think our biggest concern uh, is whether the state is uh, willing to partner with this community, because this community has a view and uh, experience that can be extremely beneficial. And I mean this community, and I'm including you in that court um, because of what you've done with a statewide network in a lot of these areas. And so uh, I can tell you that I've been very loud and passionate about this. Um, we act, uh, interestingly enough, I heard from the Lieutenant Governor over Department of Commerce that has the broadband office uh, uh, six weeks ago about uh, the state's strategic plan and how this is a big deal and we need everybody as a partner. And so I said, okay, we're one of those. And then I heard at a uh, CANREN meeting a couple of weeks ago, the broadband office saying, hey, we've already got a final draft of that strategic plan. Um, we'd love to hear what you say about it. And so that partnership didn't really exist at that point. Now, since uh, there were a few um, tantrums thrown, mine being most of them, um, I think that they did reach out to us and we actually did have an opportunity to uh, speak with the consultant that's working with that broadband team as a RITSI group, that's the Regents group, but for those who don't know, CIO group. Um, and uh, we have had an opportunity to review the draft that they came up with, which is that 30,000 foot strategic graph. It's not real tactical, but it actually is not bad. Um, and I think it could open the door to this. But when we get into the actual moving it from strategic plan to tactical plan, that's where this partnership really needs to uh, engage. And uh, we've done everything we can to reach out to them and have had good conversations with a variety of folks, but I'm still not convinced until I see the rubber hitting the road that they get that they need to uh, engage with this. Um, they have acknowledged the errors of the past and giving big bucks to big vendors and, and uh, not a lot coming out of that. So that's a major step that they've actually acknowledged the error of that way. But um, uh, you know, what I need, and James, I know you can't do this, but I need them to hear words from objective viewers like yourself who aren't Kansas specific uh, to say things like that, to let them know that we are more, we're in it more than benefiting, hey, I, as an R1 or as a university or as higher ed, uh, want to build my bandwidth up. That's not the point. The point is we have the experience in being able to help build the bandwidth up that can help the rest of the universe or rest of the community. So putting more money in the research networks isn't what we're saying. We're saying that, and I've made the case and uh, Mary and Mark can say I even had my latest tantrum an hour or so ago um, and that uh, we are you know, the question of, you know, what Canron role is this and why would you want Canron to play a part so you can boost the research uh, networks? How is that going to help economic development? My point is, that's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is Canron has the experience can help in the planning for this because they've actually done this. And so uh, we need to change that view of what we as higher ed, and I'm not just meaning publics, I mean, that's, uh, you know, every everybody within that uh, broad range of two year, four year public private, we just have an experience that they need to have at the table. Will it benefit our students, staff and faculty? Absolutely. But that's, we're not in it with the personal agenda, we're in it for the state's broader good and economic economic development capacity and many of us have had the experience of what that can do well outside of the walls of a university so um uh, i know i'm speaking to the choir here or preaching to the choir here but i think what you're saying is very important we just need a way to get that message where they actually hear that message at the state level now, I've been told this is, uh, sorry, I'm taking up the last few minutes, Susie, I'll get off uh, my soapbox here in a second. Um, I know that uh, we have started that conversation. They've actually asked us for the conversation. So that's step number one, but we need to continue this so they understand that we are actually in it for all of the state, not just for higher ed. So off my soapbox now. Yeah, no, mind if I say one more thing, I'll respond to Gary. Oh, I do have a question in the chat to get to. Okay, I just so just go quick, real quick, Gary. I just what you said there is key about the fact that 
you are in a position to help make it do it the right way, but it, for the benefit of the entire state, for those workers at home, for the, you know, for the students, the K-12 students at home. But what I wanted to highlight with the project I worked on before, they actually took the, that project that stood up the fiber and actually presented it at, to the state research network who operated it to, to um, as a cost that was presented to um, all the people who needed middle miles. So they were treated the same say, way on the books. Everything was treated the same way, but because of some of the stuff court said at the beginning, it, you know, you, you know, you're, you're, you're standing up a more reliable, more scalable network. And at the end of the day, you can present it to the same cost level to the r and &E network and um, hand that to the, the commercial providers that are now enabled to, you know, actually provide competition in Lawrence or serve Susie back when at her farm where she grew up, you know, and I think, I think that's the message. And I hope that maybe you can reach out to NTIA or some of these other past awards and get some good compelling stories that way. One of the things CTC is doing for us is compiling that in neighboring states, the success from it. A uh, question about peering and would peering relationships with carriers help middle mile? Um, it would seem like that. First off, I'll say that we offered, we offered to uh, the independent telecommunications industry in the state, we offered when the pandemic hit to peer with them. We even offered excess commodity capacity to them. So we said to them, hey, you want to peer? so that your customers who are our students can get to each other directly. And we said, you know what, everyone's gone home from campus, so we've got a whole lot of internet we're not using right now. If you need it, we'd be, uh, we'd be open to plumbing some of that to you. Do you know how many took us up on it? They told me they had no problems. They had no issues with it. But the bigger, the bigger issue, I think, with peering is the establishment that has the ability to do that, it would be successful, but peering is non, that kind of peering is non-transit. So let's say James and I, I'm going to pick on him, James and I are two small uh, in-state regional providers, and we do a great job, man. We've done fiber to the home. We got some grants. We did a great job, but, but the problem we have is either completing that or building out our wireless. And even if we did, we didn't have we don't have the kind of transport out of our service areas to deal with it. To Gary's point, if we peer with each other, that doesn't really solve the problem other than we're passing information back and forth with each other. We're still not getting to the rest of the state or out to the rest of the world. And that's uh, uh, you know we have now peering exchanges. More of them do help. They aren't a solution, but they are something that when we start solving this problem of transport and middle mile to feed the last mile networks, peering will become increasingly important. We're trying to support the idea of creating at least an additional peering exchange in Wichita and maybe something in the Salina area right now. There's an organization that's looking to spend some free government money in the state to do that, and uh, we're trying to support their efforts. Canren was a ground floor member of KCIX in Kansas City. Everyone laughed at creating a peering exchange in Kansas City because there's no content here, but it took a while, but it's starting to move data now. The uh, peering's good, but we still have the problem of last mile and middle mile, and you need both of those things to make, to really make, to really make private peering work. Oh, and by the way, the big carriers, they charge for peering now. You might be surprised to know that if I went, because we have, go to AT&T and say, hey, let's do this just so I can get your residential Kansas customers, you know, so all those people in Lawrence that have AT&T internet can get to KU and, and, you know, repeat for every other AT&T town in the state. And you know what their solution is? A product that costs more than if I just bought commodity internet from them. First it was free, then it cost a little bit, then they said just buy internet instead, and now their peering product costs more than internet. These are not these are not the organizations we need steering the bus, folks. We have a few minutes left. And by the way, Gary, never, never feel like you shouldn't be on that soapbox. I mean, the only way we're going to really change this is if enough of us get on a soapbox often enough that they have to listen to us.
you got an extra long break if no one's got anything else to say. I think this has been a great um, discussion and I, I do want to say, even though this isn't about Zoom, I know we also benefit from Canran and Zoom, so um, it's great to, to talk about all the many benefits that we get from our partnership with Canran. You know, and the stuff Gary was talking about, if we didn't spend three out of every five years just trying to negotiate new lit service contracts for our backbone, then our brightest tech folks, I mean, hey, who doesn't know Brad Fleming? I know at least half the people here do. You know, Brad and his team could spend a whole lot more time trying to figure out how to architect the dark fiber solution through four counties in western Kansas that no one wants to bury fiber in if they weren't so busy trying to figure out what kind of lit service we needed to get by another five years. And that is something I believe they should be doing. And that is something that our organization has let the state down by not figuring out a way to do. Thanks for coming today, folks. Enjoy check. I'd love to be seeing you all in person, but I'll take this. I'll take this any day. Thank you, Court. It was great. Thanks for having me, Susie. By the way, great job. I know it's a lot more people than you, but you've been the point person for me. You guys did. You rocked it this year. Thanks so much. Yeah, we appreciate you. I didn't know. Uh, I didn't know how hop in was going to work at first, but after I used it today, it's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Actually, we weren't sure how well it would work. We have a backup page with Zoom links because we were like, we might just have to go to Zoom, but um, it seems like it's working. So we just got. This is the last session of today, and then we'll have tomorrow. Right on. Well, see you around. Thank you again. Thank you. It's been great. Thank you.